إن الحمد لله يا ربي لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا ما رضيت ولك الحمد بعد رضا ولك الحمد على كل حال اللهم لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه <تصفيق> الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات عمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين يا غفور الرحيم يا رحم الرحيمين يا ذا الجلال والإكرام فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> So far we have seen the laws and commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are totally clear in Surah An-Nur Lower your gaze guard your modest modesty dress code for women not because we are responsible for the morality of men no because that is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite mercy decreed as the righteous conduct for believing women that is an important point to understand that have the men been given a set of rules of course absolutely so now look at this example one scholar gave a very good example that there is a speed limit in most countries yeah all civilized countries actually uh which is put in for safety reasons of people who use roads or highways or motorways or whatever so if this speed limit is 120 miles per hour and there's a race car driver who says hey listen you know he's going like 200 miles per hour and he gets stopped by the cops and he's saying uh by the way officer i'm a professional driver i drive at insanely high speeds so allow me to go very fast what would the answer of the uh, uh, traffic police officer be absolutely not absolutely not even you have to follow this someone says i can handle alcohol very well hmm? i can drink some and not get drunk so does that mean that alcohol will be halal for that person because he doesn't get drunk no we need to really understand that this was the be the ayat that we have covered so far have been the most intense part of surah anu gender issues and inner purification that must manifest on the outside too and all of this is for my benefit for your benefit for the benefit of the entire society hmm? one thing we really need to understand whether we understand the commandments of allah or whether we find it challenging and difficult to swallow at first read let's put it this way we all go through humps in the quran we find some issue difficult to swallow others find uh, another issue difficult to deal with that's fine that's fine the point is that we must be humble in our deen we must have that mindset that allah subhanahu wa taala knows and i do not that humility is extremely important So when it comes to all these commandments of Surah Nur, whether it was uh, the punishments for zina, whether it was the dress code, this whole this whole scenario that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given us, which is an important part of our life, do we need other role models to see the interpretation of the ayat of the Quran, the commandments of God, role models other than Rasul Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, other than the Sahabiyah, other than the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? One thing is. that i am not strong enough yet to follow these commandments that's a very very different thing but to deny the commandments to doubt and reject the commandments that is another league altogether if we are not ready for whatever reason busy we are not determined we are not 100% there no issue but why lose our humility why become defiant why the arrogance to say that no no that's not islam this is all just nonsense that molvies have come up with these are two different attitudes two different spectrums what we are trying to do here 
is that we are trying to get rid of our defiance and our arrogance. What our amal is, is between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But let's be humble. Let's be open-minded. Let's trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a change. And be tolerant and just and kind to the hijabi and niqabi woman and to the women and men who are trying to implement these laws on themselves. And the rest is up to our own iman, our own heart, and our own taqwa. Right? Having said that, let's now move on to ayah number 32. Now, this is also uh, an ayat, uh, ayah number 32 and 30, the, 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 the 33, which some of us might find a slightly difficult to deal with. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help, let's see what Allah is saying. In ayah number 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, marry those from among you who are not married, who are unmarried. And the slave men and women who are righteous, if they are poor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the word, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them from his fadl, like, means that he is wide of resources. He has unlimited resources. So what will he do? He will give from those unlimited resources to those who are unable to find themselves in a financial position to get married. <coughs> in ayah number 33, let's read the ayat and then we'll uh, <coughs> discuss them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those of you who are unable to get married right, should guard their chastity until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them both independence through his grace. Now let's stop here and then we will come to the uh, next, next part in a minute. So first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just encouraging, but almost legislating that get married, get married, get married. Yeah? There is no reason for us or people around us, or a community to stay single. It is liked in our deen that people should get married young. What does that mean? That we should have a conducive environment for marriage. When we talk about, um, you know, uh, somebody was telling me the other day that you need to spend three months salary on an engagement ring only then will you prove to that person, to that girl, the guy will prove to that girl that he really cares for her and he really loves her. Where are these artificial mercenary standards coming from? When we are going to focus on shebang weddings, large, huge 2,000 people affairs, 10 events, who's going to be able to afford it? How many people will be able to afford it? We have made marriage so difficult. And first of all, you hear people saying that, you know, I need to check out somebody for at least a year, six months, two years or whatever before I commit to them. You know, my mom says something very profound and very wise. She says, no matter how long you've been dating somebody, until and unless you actually share a toothpaste and you are sharing a room, you don't really know that person. That is a fact. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, arrange the marriage of those who are unmarried from among you. Right? To the extent that Allah is saying, even those who are bond, who, who are slaves, get married to them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged that big time as well. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Oh, I should have put this hadith after this. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged that as well. So when we are talking about getting married after I, you know, of course, education is very important. Nobody is saying get married without being educated. But make marriage conducive. Find spouses for each other. Whether it is 
uh, amongst friends or families, arrange a marriage, you want to introduce somebody to somebody. The idea is that don't stay single to the best of your ability. Now, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't chosen that spouse for you, by the way, that is Allah's choice, then we can hang on. But then what do you do? Then you save yourself. If you can't afford to get married, whether it is financially or you're not find, finding the right spouse, keep yourself pure. You know, protect and guard your chastity. That is super, super, super important. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh, young men, whoever among you can afford to get married, let him marry, for it is more effective in lowering the gaze and protecting the private parts. Whoever cannot do that, then let him fast, for it is for his own protection. The thing that scholars tell us, and rightly so, is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about yani, um, fasting as a cure for the problem of lust, uh, Zina happens when when there is unbridled lust. Then zina happens. So Allah is saying, control your lust. And one uh, suggestion and one uh, cure for this problem is that you fast. But fasting will be a cure for this problem of lust if you are already following the other injunctions of deen. And this is for both men and women, by the way. This is for both boys and girls, by the way. Just like when a doctor prescribes medicine for diabetes, for example, but you're gobbling up lemon tarts and gulab jamuns all around, then how will that medicine work? So if you fast and don't lower the gaze, it will nullify the beneficial effects of fasting. And this is important. And we all are part of a community, part of a society, and we all need to follow this commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Arrange the marriage of those who are not married among you. Not have such stringent and impossible standards, you know, whether looking for a girl or whether looking for a boy, both ways. Don't have impossible standards. Don't wait for like, you know, okay, so I'm going to do this first and that first and a master's degree and a, I don't know, seven figure salary before I even think about marriage. No, I'm going to have a live-in relationship before I even consider marriage. Nikah has baraka in it. Nikah has baraka in it. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that people marry for four reasons generally. One is beauty. One is lineage. Yani which family do you come from? One is wealth. And the other is taqwa. Yani uh, being a righteous person, iman and taqwa. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recommended marry for taqwa. It doesn't mean that you don't look at other things, but top of the list should be for a believing person, taqwa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who take this advice and heed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet seriously. Okay. Now in ayah number 33, first of all, Allah is saying that uh, those who cannot marry should fast. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I, we did that. Uh, that those who cannot marry, yeah, uh, they should be keeping themselves chaste. You should, they should not be sleeping around. They should not be having affairs. They should not be uh, testing out the waters. Don't do that. Right? If you're not married, you're not married. That's it. You should not be having any kind of lustful relationships with the opposite sex. Then Allah says, and those of your slaves hmm, who wish to enter the contract of kitaba, contract kitaba with them. If you recognize some good in them and give them out of the wealth or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and do not com uh, compel your uh, uh, women, your girl slaves into prostitution. If they wish to observe chastity in order that you may seek the temporary benefit of the worldly life. If one compels them, then after their being compelled, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving and very merciful. Now, this issue of slavery is also something that we uh, kind of struggle with. Let's put it this way. So we're not going to go into huge detail, but let's just talk about it since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about this over here. If you want to listen to more detail about Ma Malakat Aymanukum, you can listen to uh, Surah Baqarah recordings, which are available uh, online. Yeah. So this is another big one, slavery. 
Now, when we want to talk about something that predates Islam, this is where you bring in the history and anthropology. What was pre-Islamic? This is the place for that. Before Islam, there was slavery. Islam didn't invent slavery. When the end of Islam came, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a certain process by which slavery would be eliminated. Right? And history testifies to the fact that the Islamic civilization went through that process and did eliminate slavery. In fact, slavery continued in the West in colonialism. And after colonialism, they also stopped slavery. Now, we can say that there is a new type of slavery, which is segregation, racism, and prejudice. And if we look at, say, the civil rights movements, uh, a movement led by Malcolm X in the United States, uh, which was in the 1960s, and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa by Nelson Mandela, as recently as in the 1980s, actually, then we can see that, that they abolished the laws of discrimination but discrimination and racism exists in the hearts of people still, right? That is another conversation, right? That is another common conversation. Here particularly is the issue of having marital relations with slaves, yeah? So get married to a righteous slave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, social status is not important. Taqwa is what is important. Just, just, we just saw that hadith, that select your spouse on the basis of tahwa. It doesn't matter what their social standing is. It really doesn't matter, even if they are a slave. Now, there are no slaves these days, although we do know that even today, slavery is manifest in various different forms, in various different ways. So for that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is she saying? What, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? What is he saying? Um, I'm sorry, I said she. <clears throat> what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is that for that time, when there was slavery, the slave would set a price to buy their freedom. And they would be allowed to work by their master and the wages would be used to buy their freedom. We see in the Quran in many, many different places that freeing a slave is part of the kafara or uh, uh, part of what you can do to, uh, uh, in, uh, if you have sinned, uh, you, you can pay a kafara. One of the things is for slave, freeing a slave. Incredible reward of freeing slaves. We see that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam talked about, and we see that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself and all of the Sahaba were first and foremost in freeing so many slaves in their times. So that is one thing about slavery. The modern day slavery we see is very much there. So basically, Islam gave huge incentives to free slaves and work towards abolishing the system. Do not force female slaves into prostitution in your quest for worldly goods. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is legislating against that. This is not an option. This is a legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even back in the day, Mushrikun used to do that. And Allah is saying, if anyone forces that woman Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving to that woman. Most forgiving to that woman. Today, even we see that this slavery, this flourish, flourishing sex trade, which involves majority of women and a lot of children, but particularly females, majority of women, is flourishing. Why? Because we are not working towards a moral society. We are not working to stop the demand. When the demand is going to be there, the supply will be there. And what we see is that whoever is patronizing this trade, they are considered to be like socially uplifted, the elite or sharif, like we say in Urdu. And the poor women who are trapped into this terrible, terrible degrading trade, they are the dirty ones. They are the ones who are shunned by society. They are the ones who are ostracized. It's the other way around. Could you ever imagine, the first time I read this, I, I was shocked that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about prostitution in this pure kalam of his. And why wouldn't he? Because it is a fact of life. Because it is all around us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about big time, about the uplift of all of those members of society who are subjugated to oppression, 
subjugated to zulm, subjugated to torture by people around them, both men and women. It's not exclusively that it's only the men, right? So Allah is saying that that woman or those women who have been forced into prostitution, what scholars say is that this was applied back in the day at that time, as well as today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and she doesn't want to do it. She's a believing servant of Allah, right? And, and she's forced, she has no way out. She's stuck in a situation which she can't get out of. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafurur rahim to her, not the one who's forcing her, not the one who's perpetuating this crime. And this ayah is absolutely amazing and important for counselors of women who are victims of rape, of harassment, of any kind of abuse, victims of any times of coercion into doing things that they don't want to do themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands your situation. He will not hold you liable in any way. You should not feel guilt in any way. You should not feel shame in any way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ghafoor and Rahim. So with such a merciful God, how can we be skeptical about the commandments that take, personal commandments or commandments for a whole society that he has given? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking the side of women in the Quran big time, whether it is a, a, a wife who has been abused by a man, whether it is uh, a, a divorce situation that spouses are going through. And now Allah is talking about prostitution over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sides with the female gender. Why don't we see that? Why are we so blind to that in the Quran? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who work for the uplift of all areas of our society and particularly those women who are forced into prostitution. Then in ayah number 34, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, oh, okay, now we, we must have a look at this hadith before we go to ayah 34. Uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an has reported that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are three whom it is a right upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help, one who gets married seeking chastity. Yeah. This attraction between men and women, this sexual attraction is a huge part of who we are. We cannot deny that. We cannot deny that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a legal way to fulfill that desire, to fulfill that lust, include because that lust and desire includes love and care. It includes love and care. It is not a selfish thing. It is not one of those situations that you take advantage of a woman, or uh, it's very rare, but still there, that a woman takes advantage of a man and then just goes off and then just walks off. No, that fulfillment of the desire comes with responsibility, comes with care, comes with a family, comes with support, yeah, all of that. And then that makes it so much more special. And the best part is that it comes with the barakah and the uh, approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one is a person, yeah, whether it's a girl or a boy, and they are feeling these feelings and they don't want to, they want to lower their gaze. They don't want to watch nonsense uh, or on, uh, on on their screen and get turned on and then do something which is not sort of um, really in, in, in the ethos of our deen and um, they want to get married, then make an effort to get them married. Yeah. And the second category, a slave who makes a contract with his master with the aim of buying his freedom. And the third category, the one who fights for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, then in ayah number 34, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَلَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ آيَاتٍ مُبَيِّنَاتٍ وَمَثَلًا مِنَ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمَوْعِرَةً لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Indeed, we have revealed and sent down upon you clear ayats. And مَثَلًا آيَاتِ مُبَيِّنَاتٍ clear ayats. Right? Mathalan, yani narratives, stories, some examples uh, from those who passed before you. And all of this advice is a counsel for who? Lil Muttaqeen, for those who have taqwa. At the end of the day, all of the ayat of the Quran, 
not just the ayat of Surah An-Nur, but all of the ayat of the Quran, all of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are a counsel and advice for whom? For a believer who has taqwa in his heart. The Quran begins with what? In Surah Baqarah, Allah says, Hudalil Muttaqeen. This is Hidayah for the Muttaqeen. This is counsel for the Muttaqeen. Without that, then there is no counsel. Without that, there is skepticism. Without that, there is agnosticism. Without that, there is atheism, Nauzubillah. It just kind of uh, downward spirals. So all of the commandments, Allah is saying, these are clear. There's no muddle up here. And who will take heed? the people of taqwa will take heed. Now, ayah number 35, we come to our ayat An-Nur, one of the most amazing ayat of the Quran. So the surah is named after this ayah, Surah Nur. There's so many things in this ayah that, you know, we might go uh, back and forth a little bit in trying to understand and have our several layers and bubbles of understanding, inshallah ta'ala. So first, let's uh, just look at the translation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Allah samawati wal ard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the nur, the light of the heavens or celestial, celestial realms and the earth. Mathalu nurihi kamishkah fiha mishbah kum the likeness of his divine light is as follows. There is a niche. There is a niche and in it is a lamp. And the lamp is inside a glass. And the lamp is inside a glass as if it was a shining or glittering or blazing star. Then, lit from a blessed tree of olive. Yani blessed olive tree is Zaytuna. Zaytuna. Um, and literally, neither from where the sun rises, now this is about the tree, neither from where the sun rises, neither from the east, nor from, the, from where the sun sets, any the west. Yakadu, Yakadu, I can't read it on the slide. I'm going to look at my. Yakadu Zaituha, you be o walau lam tamsa tamsa The oil is near to be luminous, to give light, light even before any fire, right? So, Zaituha, uh, yani Yakadu means near, it is near that Zaituha, its oil is so shiny and so luminous that it is already like kind of just giving light. You know, it's so luminous, even before it is ignited, even before it is lit. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, uh, even if even before it is touched with any kind of fire or light, nurun ala nur, light upon light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu li nurihi man yasha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides to his nur, to his light, whomsoever he wills. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws comparisons and points, similitudes and examples. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for linnas, for people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all of the knowledge of each and everything. Now, Various different mufassirun, various different people of the Quran have given explanations of these ayats in various different ways. And that doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong. Because this, this is such a deep ayah, Allah is talking about such spiritual and mystical things in here, that it can be interpreted, interpreted in several different ways. So if you 
if we talk about one interpretation here and you've heard another one, that's perfectly all right. It doesn't mean one is right and one is wrong. So the first thing, Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light of the heavens and the earth. According to Ibn Abbas, it means the guide of the, the that light, Allah Nuru Sama, the light of God is the guide of the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth. He has looked at it in that way. Another scholar has said that concerning Allah is the light of the heavens of the earth. It means that he is controlling the affairs of the heavens and the earth and the stars and the sun and the moon. Right. So the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light of his control. That is one way of looking at it. And like I said, all of these could be true simultaneously. All of these are correct simultaneously. Then <clears throat> another scholar says that Allah, uh, Allah wal yani by the light of the divine light, light of God, the heavens and the earth are illuminated. Not just physically, not just physical illumination. We're not just talking about the light of the sun, but spiritual illumination comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, let's look at this hadith and we'll come back. Uh, Ibn Abbas ta'ala said that when Rasulullah used to get up for tahajjud, right, prayer, night prayer, he would say, Oh Allah, to you be praised. You are the sustainers, the sustainer of the heaven and earth and whosoever is in them. To you be praised. You are the light of the heavens and the earth and whosoever is in them. So Rasulullah used to make this beautiful, beautiful dua, which was the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his tahajjud. Okay. Then as we move on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, here, the parable of his light, yeah, the example of his right of his light. Again, there are several views concerning that, the meaning. First of all, two opinions regarding the meaning of this pronouns, uh, pronoun. Mathala Nuri he, this pronoun he, the uh, the example of his light. Mm -hmm. uh, some scholars have said that it refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the parable of his guidance in the heart of the believer is as a niche. This was a view of Ibn Abbas, that is one opinion. And the second view is that this he is referring to the believer, to the believer, which is indicated by the context of the words and implies that the parable of the light in the heart of the believer is as a niche. So the heart of the believer and what he is naturally inclined to of guidance and what he learns of the Quran, which is according, according to his natural inclinations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran, right? We're going to go a little back and forth over here. Can they who rely on a clear proof from their Lord and whom a witness from him recites it, can they be equal to the disbelievers? What is the answer? No, of course they cannot be. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already created us with his recognition, with the light of his recognition inside of our hearts. The pilot flame of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's recognition is inside each and every human being. Now, when that person, that human being is aware of that light all of a sudden, there's so much darkness around, there's so much darkness of confusion so much darkness of zulm, so much darkness of oppression, so much darkness of all kinds of isms which are confusing us all the time. And then all of a sudden you have the ping moment. You see the, you know, you come upon the Quran, whether you're a born Muslim or not, you come upon the Quran and you just feel that flame which is inside of you glow a little bit more. And sometimes it can be a scary feeling. When Iman enters the heart, remember when, when Rasulullah got his Nabuwa, was it a comforting feeling or was it a scary feeling? It was a terrifying feeling for him. It was a terrifying experience. What is going on? Right? So sometimes it can be very terrifying when we realize that there is this recognition of God inside of me. 
And it makes perfect sense when I'm reading the Quran. When I'm reading the ayat of Surah Noor, I, it resonates in my heart because that purity is there. Because that purity is there. So we see that some people, some believers, all believers are not at the same level. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the heart of the believer in its purity and clarity is likened to a lamp in transparent and jewel-like glass. Yani, the mishkat fiha misbah and al misbah fi zujaja, right? And az zujaja ka annaha kauka durri. Yani, there's this whole process. So there are these layers and layers of recognition that we have. Hmm? The heart of the believer, the pilot flame is there. He recognizes it, is recognizes it and tries to increase the flame of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's understanding, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nur. And that is then reflected on the glass. Now, the glass is important because there, there are winds of ignorance around. There are winds, winds of uh, uh, a misguidance around. And the believer wants to protect that flame, wants to protect that light, which is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to protect the iman which is inside of him. So he needs to have that glass around. Just like, you know, like the hurricane lamp that we have. If you take the hurricane lamp outside, you need to have that glass around. Na? It's important. Otherwise, the flame will go poof. It will go out. Some people's glass is simple, like a hurricane lamp. And some people's glass, when they work on themselves, they want to purify themselves more they follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the tea, then they become luminous like a chandelier. And chandeliers are usually made of cut glass, aren't they? Like good crystal, even good crystal glasses or good, good crystal bowls are made of cut glass. And how do you get these cuts? What are these cuts? If there's a process of mm, actually taking a pure piece of glass and applying pressure to it, applying sharp instruments to it. So a believer is willing to go through trials and tribulations and making sacrifices for the sake of his iman. So that 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 zujaja of his is really amazing. And the, the illumination from that, it goes far and wide. So he's willing to make that sacrifices to become that chandelier, to become that cut glass crystal. Yeah. So he's doing that. Yeah, that's what's happening. And the Quran and the Sharia by which it is guided are likened to good, pure, shining oil in which there is no impurity or deviation. You know, like we say, uh, uh, first, you know, the purest form of olive oil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about that. Zaytuna. You know, you know, the oil itself is so pure. The oil itself is so uh, uh, free of any kind of that it shines, it is shining on its own, just waiting for that light to come and poof, then it is going to be illuminated like nobody's business. So Ibn Abbas and uh, other scholars also said that this refers to the position of the wick in the lamp. You know, it's in the heart of the lamp, isn't it? Yeah. So the heart of the believer in its purity and clarity is like a lamp transparent and jewel-like, which is in a transparent and jewel-like glass. Now, the flame that burns brightly, or it was said that the niche is a niche in the house. That was another uh, uh, explanation. Uh, this is the parable given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of obedience to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls obedience to him as light. Then he calls it by other numerous, numerous names. The lamp is the light, and this refers to the Quran and the faith that is in the heart. And one scholar said, it is the lamp. The lamp is in the glass, means this light is shining in this beautiful and clear glass. Hmm? So all of these are true. All of these are true. None of it is uh, untrue. What we need to focus on is to get the gist of this ayah, which is, that the noor is from God, the pilot flame is from God. It is up to you and me. That is a choice that we make as believers. How high do you want that flame to be? 
how high do you want your iman to go how luminous do you want your spirituality to be yeah. it, it, it is just such an amazing aya that you can read it like 20 times and get 20 different angles and 20 different ways of understanding it then allah says that it is from a blessed tree meaning it is derived from olive oil from a bread blessed tree yani a tree of olive uh, allah subhanahu wa taala talks about the olive and the olive tree a lot in the quran and allah says neither of the east nor of the west it means it does not uh, it is not in either any in eastern part of the land or on the western part of the land and some scholars say it is in such a central position that the light of the sun touches it all the time it's not shaded it is not in darkness at any time so when the sun rises it is in a position when it will get the sun when the sun sets it is in a position that it will get the light of the sun so it has got the best of both worlds so that is why it glows so much that is why it is so pure right and this is the best kind of oil when the sun rises it reaches the tree from the east and when it sets it reaches it from the west hmm? whose oil would almost glow forth though no fire touched it because the oil itself is shining the heart of the believer is already so pure that it is simply waiting for the message of allah subhanahu wa taala to reach it and what scholars tell us is that abu bakr radhiyallahu taala an is the most amazing amazing example of this yeah Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that when i gave the message to people everybody hesitated for a bit everybody except abu bakr because he was so luminous and so pure from inside anyways that his lamp was the the, the pilot flame was there just waiting for the right uh, uh, message to strike the message from god to strike we read the quran sometimes and for us puny little uh believers with maybe uh, our iman is over near the iman of uh, uh, abu bakr or or the taqwa of uh, uh, of the companions sallallahu uh, alaihi uh, uh, radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma but sometimes alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us more and more and increase our light more and more but sometimes you read ayat of the quran and you don't even need an explanation for it has that happened to you it happens to us at times when we internalize <coughs> our quest for god when we are firmly established on finding the truth allah subhanahu wa taala answers in that manner when we work on cleansing our heart when we work on getting rid of the lusts and the worldly desires and anything which is other than god then allah subhanahu wa taala responds Allah says look inside of you you will find yourself and you will find me when we find ourselves and we find Allah usually it happens sometimes it can happen when you're sitting in public sometimes that ping moment can happen any time it's not necessary that it happens in the middle of the night although what we learn from scholars is that the possibility of reaching god so to speak in a spiritual manner the possibility is very high when you are on your own when you are contemplating on the ayat of allah subhanahu wa taala whether in the quran or whether outside right whether contemplating on a tree or or the sun or the moon or looking at the waves coming back and forth or whatever looking uh, you know hearing the chirping of birds or just a spider making its web it could be anything it could be anything just looking at your own hands and wondering how is this blood flowing through my veins yeah hearing putting your uh, hand on your heart and hearing the duk 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 right and you know the science of it but the iman of it just rises in a moment second in a, in, in a second those are the moments when you don't need any explanation those are the moments when you are really reaching towards the divine and this is the aya which helps us reach there this is the aya if we sit and contemplate on that and pray to allah subhanahu wa taala help me polish my heart because the first step has to be mine 
I have to submit. I have to follow the commandment. I have to understand. And you know, a true believer is one who follows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments, whether he understands them or whether he doesn't understand them. That is, understands them. That is besides the point. Sometimes we will perhaps not understand 100% of the Quran, but we still believe that this is from our Lord. We may not agree in our, you know, insights with all of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We might struggle, but we know that this is for my benefit. This is the best option that I can choose from. Yeah, that is what this ayah is all about. How to increase our nur, how to uh, make our heart so pure that this magic of Quran and Sunnah, this pure oil of Quran and Sunnah simply illuminates our insights. And Alhamdulillah, imagine the timings that we are doing Surah al nur right before Ramadan. Ramadan is what, what, 20 days away or something? Uh, it's, I think, 10th Shaban today, isn't it? 20 days away. So this is a, the Ramadan is a golden opportunity because shaitan is, uh, uh, you know, chained up and we are more focused towards the Quran. We are more focused to, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a wonderful opportunity to work on our increasing of our iman and clearing of our hearts. Alhamdulillah. We can go on and on about this ayah, actually. We can really go on and on about this ayah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who are like Abu Bakr, who are like the Sahaba. Yeah, inshallah, inshallah, ameen. Then in ayah number 36. Oh, okay. This, this is an important hadith. Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created his creation in darkness. Then on the same day, he sent his light upon them. Whoever was touched by his light on that day will be guided, and whoever was missed will be led astray. Hence, I say, the pens have dried in accordance, uh, accordance with the knowledge of God. May he be glorified. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when Allah talks about that, Allah chooses whoever is going to get guidance and whoever is not going to get guidance. That means that that person's choice is going to be the foremost. It's not like now, Allah has got any uh, anything against anybody. If I choose guidance, Allah will give it to me. If I choose the light, I will get it. Right? That's a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I don't, I will, I will get that. Then I will get misguidance. So sometimes we uh, uh, we get confused that if Allah is not has chosen, you know, he chooses who to guide. He chooses those to guide who want to guidance themselves. So we should clarify that. And this is another beautiful hadith about the kinds of hearts, what Rasulullah has told us. He said, وسلم, hearts are of four kinds. The heart that is clear, like a shining lamp. The heart that is covered and tied up. The heart that is upside down. And the heart that is clad in armor. As for the clear heart, <clears throat> it is the heart of the believer in which is a lamp filled with light. What we, what we talked about in uh, in this ayah. Where is it filled with light? Yeah. As for the covered heart, this is the heart of the disbeliever. As for the upside down heart, that is the heart of the hypocrite who recognizes then denies. As for the armor clad heart, this is the heart in which there is both faith and hypocrisy. The parable of the faith in it is like that, like that of a legume a sprout that is irrigated with good water and the likeness of the hypocrisy in it is that of sores that are fed by blood and pus. Whichever of the two prevails is the characteristic that will dominate. And what does he mean by prevail? Whichever of it is it that we feed, that we give the, 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 the pure oil to, or we starve. You know, there's a very famous uh, uh, saying uh, which is associated to uh, Native Americans that uh, uh, one elder said that we have two wolves inside of us. Hmm? One is the good guy and one is the bad guy. Hmm? And um, uh, he was saying this to a child or something. So he said that, how do we, what do we do? How do we control these wolves? He said, whichever one you feed is the one that is going to get stronger inside of you. So whichever whichever way we want our hearts to grow, grow that is where it, they'll grow, grow. What I watch, what I 
hear what I experience, where I go, all of that have a profound effect on my heart. Profound effect. When I lower my gaze, my heart, the, the flame inside it gets a little brighter. When I stop my hands from doing something which is impermissible by God, the flame gets a little higher. When I stop my tongue from uttering something which is impermissible by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the flame gets higher. So Allah has given us all of these opportunities to work on our heart and we should pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, that we listen to that, we pay heed to that and we become people of understanding with clear hearts. So um, we have five minutes to go, but I'm going to stop here because we will start the uh, uh, next portion of the surah after that. If you guys have any questions, please, please, please feel free to send them in on the WhatsApp groups or over here if you like. And I will request once again that please sign in with your full names and please sign in uh, uh, with your full names on the WhatsApp groups as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us in completing the surah to the best possible manner. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Allahumma rabbana ja'alna minhum alladheena amanu wa amilu shalihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil shabr ameen ya rabbil alameen ya ghafurur rahim ya arhamu rahimeen ya zal jalali wal ikram <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.